Welcome to another episode of T-Rex Talk, where we, oh wait, no, that's, uh, that's our podcast, uh, which you should probably be listening to. This is T-Rex Labs. This is where we do videos, where we visualize things that are otherwise impossible to see, like radio waves and band plans. In this video, we want to talk about radio licenses. We've talked about different radio bands and how they propagate in previous videos. We're going to talk about different radio modes in the future and different things that they can accomplish. But to further break things down, let's talk about the licenses that different radios require to do different things. And uh, we'll use the same graph that we did in the last video on radio propagation. Up here, we have our high notes. Uh, kind of like a piano. This is our high frequency stuff. And then down here we have our low frequency notes. And uh, once again, like the last video, we'll start up here in the very high end. There are a bunch of radio devices that don't need a license at all for anyone to operate them. Things like your Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and uh, maybe your cordless phone if you still have one of those. Those are up here in the ISM bands, the 2.4 gigahertz, the 900 megahertz. Uh, ISM bands are industrial and scientific and medical and you don't need a license to operate those. And then um, your phone also has uh, radios to talk to AT&T. You don't need a license to operate in this spectrum right here because AT&T does. But your phone does need to have certain FCC certifications to prove that it doesn't go outside of what is allowed. Because even though you don't need a license for Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi needs to be a specific wattage. So this right here is going to be our frequency. This right here is going to be like our range uh, or the amount of watts that you can push through a radio. There are limits to what a Wi-Fi radio can do and they're not supposed to be blasting a huge amount of RF energy up in this space. Uh, and then you have handheld radios like FRS, which stands for Family Radio Service. Another thing that you can use without any license whatsoever because it's not allowed to use very much power. This is limited to, on some channels, half of a watt, and on other channels, as much as two watts. Now these FRS radios will give you 22 channels, which are gonna be the UHF area of 462 to 467 in there. And there are some other rules too, like they gotta have fixed antennas that don't come off, which you know, I kind of ask the question of the FCC, what do you mean by non-removable antennas? Because technically every antenna is removable. Just ask my kids. Uh, but let's say you want a little more range, you want a little more power, you want a little more capability than just FRS. Well, for that, you actually have another possibility, which is GMRS. This is a general purpose one, and it does require that you get a license. The license is $35 and it allows everybody in your family, possibly household, but definitely family, to use the radios for on a single license. And that actually lets you operate on exactly the same frequencies as FRS, but it lets you go up to five watts on a handheld device, but it also lets you use mobile devices mounted inside a vehicle, say, and those can go up to 50 watts. You're allowed to use removable antennas on those, obviously, and then you're also allowed to use GMRS repeaters. So the way that you can extend your radio reach in this particular area is uh, pretty phenomenal. There's also a couple of extra channels in there, uh, narrow band channels that go a little bit further. Uh, inside the same frequency range, they squeeze 30 channels. And the interesting thing is that is interoperable with FRS. Your GMRS radios that are more powerful can listen to and talk to the FRS radio. So it's a kind of a handy thing. If you are a little bit more advanced than some of your friends, and you have a little bit more advanced radios that you have programmed to do GMRS stuff on because you have the license, uh, you can interact with people who don't. Uh, you may not be able to always hear them if you're outside of their range, but they will be able to hear you and you will be able to demonstrate your superior radio power and skills. 
Uh, now, as you remember, possibly, from the radio propagation video a couple of weeks ago, which you should go back and watch if you haven't seen it, VHF frequencies sometimes go farther than UHF frequencies. And VHF frequencies also have a radio type uh, that is available to use with no license whatsoever. No fee, no certification, no registration whatsoever, and that is called MERS. MERS stands for Multi-Use Radio Service, which is extremely specific. And MERS operates in that VHF spectrum of 151 to 154 megahertz, and you max out at uh, two watts. You're actually only given five channels inside of that small space, but it does let you do stuff in VHF. And there's a bunch of uh, not only handheld radios, but uh, sensors and things that use MERS to communicate because that VHF um, frequency does allow you to go just a little bit further. It doesn't have quite as much usability or quite as much extensibility or quite as many options as GMRS, but no license fee, no certifications. Uh, you are supposed to get radios that are certified for use on MERS frequencies. I'll talk more about that certification process and some of those requirements in a little bit. Now, speaking of VHF, there's also marine radios. And speaking of marine radios, there's also aviation radios. And I don't really want to get too much into these because if you are already a pilot, you already have a whole bunch of study that you have to do on air traffic control and the ways to use those radios and those radio certification processes. So that's kind of outside of the scope of this video. Uh, maritime radio, sort of the same thing. There's already a bunch of stuff that you, as a uh, owner and driver of a boat, is it called driver? I'm pretty sure it's called driver of a boat, uh, will know some of the radio stuff. But there are rules and regulations, and a lot of those things are specific to specific bands, and sometimes with the marine radios, they're specific to uh, being on or near water. So yeah, if that's something you specifically need to get into, you should be on a different channel. We're uh, landlocked here in Tennessee. So if you wanna be doing stuff on VHF, you can use MERS. Uh, and then the other thing that you probably are already thinking about is amateur radio. Now, amateur radio is where things start to get complicated because unlike FRS and GMRS and MERS, we're not talking about a single band. We're talking about 29 different bands that amateurs are allowed to use across this huge spectrum from all the way way up here i think in uh, like 12,000 megahertz 1200 megahertz uh, all the way down to like two megahertz and there are little slices of spectrum that you can use for all kinds of different stuff now to make matters more confusing there are parts of spectrum that can only be used for certain types of radio communication. So there is a voice, there is Morse code, which hams call CW, there are data modes, there is slow scan television, there's just all kinds of different ways that you can broadcast in different parts of this spectrum and at different power levels once you have your amateur license. Oh, and there's actually three amateur licenses. There is the beginner one, which is called technician, uh, it's really kind of them not to make you start out with a humiliating name like beginner. You start out as a technician. And then your second level is general, and the highest level is extra, because it is, it is pretty extra. Now, different levels of ham radio license will allow you to do different stuff. But I really want you to focus on the general qualification. It actually gives you most of what you will want to do on the HF spectrum down here. Uh, and extra lets you do stuff like test other people who want to get their amateur radio licenses. Now, part of the reason that there are all these different licenses is not uh, just, as you might suspect, so the FCC can make money. The FCC already makes uh, tons of money from our taxes. The U.S. government, uh, that's, that's kind of how it works. The reason that there is this level of coordination across these different things is because there's a lot of stuff that happens on the radio wave. So up here in between 2.4 gigahertz and 900 megahertz is where almost all cell phone traffic is happening. Down here there's GPS data and uh, also television broadcasts happen in here. In between all these different areas where we have handheld radios and GMRS and amateur stuff, there is other stuff that is generally happening. We have air traffic control and other aviation radio. Down here between, uh, I guess it's 108 megahertz and 88 megahertz is your FM radio. 
so that you can have your morning shows and uh, your classic radio hits of the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, 10s, and today. And uh, then down here you have shortwave radio, which is uh, actually kind of interesting. We'll get to that later. Uh, so let's talk about those testing requirements. In the past, you had to have volunteers uh, who were other ham radio guys who had reached that extra level grade your tests and actually give you these licenses. Well, one of the few uh, good things that came out of COVID and the COVID lockdowns was that uh, we actually are allowed to take these tests online. Now you're still doing it with uh, volunteers uh, who will grade your tests for you. And um, at this point, it's pretty easy to find some of these different groups. If you just Google for them, online ham radio test, it's pretty simple. And the first thing you will find are practice tests, which is the best way to study for your amateur license. Take a bunch of practice tests uh, until you're scoring at about 70%. Make sure that you're scoring about 70% on those general tests because you want access to this HF space right in here. And then get online and take the test. There is a $35 fee at the moment, at the time of the recording of this video, in order to take the test. If you pass the technician level test, uh, you can then take the general test for free. You're allowed to keep taking tests uh, until you fail on the same 35 bucks. So if you have made good use of your time with those practice tests, $35 will get you to general, which is where I am at. That will get you access to 29 different slices of spectrum, and you can do almost anything you want on there without reason. And you can use almost any equipment. The way that the amateur license works is you don't need a specific radio that has been certified for a specific band. Uh, it is your responsibility to make sure that you are following the rules. So you can use almost any radio that falls within those rules. You can make your own radio. In fact, that's kind of the point of amateur radio, especially back in the old days. You can make your own antennas, you can make your own radios, you can do almost anything you want inside of these limits. Certain parts of the band allow you to use very high levels of power, other areas lower power, and uh, again, certain slivers of the spectrum are for voice specifically, are for data specifically, are for Morse code, etc. But once you have that ham radio license, you can use this UHF space right here. You have a sliver that is just below FRS, and then there's a VHF slot you can use, which is just below uh, MERS. And then you have all this HF down here. Again, if you have watched that radio propagation video, you know that HF offers you some considerable power and some really interesting abilities that no handheld radio can touch to talk beyond the curvature of the earth. Uh, people keep mentioning the flat, the flatness, but it's not flat. There's curvature to the earth and you can shoot over the horizon and skip over uh, across the atmosphere and talk to people on the other side of the globe using HF, something that is impossible with the higher frequencies. You have tremendous communication potential once you get into this space here. And really, the only way to operate in this space here is with that amateur license. So it really does give you the best bang for your buck, even though there are certain restrictions. One restriction is that you have to regularly identify yourself using your call sign. When you pass the test and you are registered with the FCC, you get a call sign. Uh, another one is that all of your communications need to be in the clear. No encryption is allowed. Uh, experimental data modulation modes are allowed, but not encryption. So figure that out. Now, there are a couple of other licenses available that I want to talk about because you're probably interested in them. Let's say you don't want to talk to people on the other side of the country. Let's say you just want to do small unit stuff. And let's say you do want encryption. Well, there is a license for that too. In fact, there's, there's several business band licenses and different ways that you can get business band licenses. You're also not supposed to use ham radio license for business purposes. You're not supposed to coordinate business activities using your amateur radio license, but it's pretty cost effective to get a business band license. It depends on how complicated you want to get. There are pretty big swaths of spectrum, mostly up in this space, for people that want to do business stuff on radio. And uh, you can actually get a section of frequency devoted just to you. It is yours exclusively to use if you jump through the right hoops. And the best way to do that is with a frequency coordinator. In fact, 
some of those permanent allocations require that you go through a frequency uh, coordinator and they will help you fill out all the paperwork and they will go and they will get your license from the FCC for you. So if that is something that you absolutely must have, your very own frequency that nobody else touches, that is what you need to Google. Frequency coordinator and you will spend hundreds or up to thousands of dollars depending on how much frequency you want and what you're going to do with it and how many uh, employees you have and how many radios you're going to run and how many repeaters you're going to run. But you probably don't actually need that. See, the fact is that business band radio used to be incredibly common for business purposes and it actually is getting used less and less. More and more businesses coordinate over phones now, believe it or not, and even places like fast food restaurants that used to use radios uh, inside of the fast food place, a lot of those are using Wi-Fi intercoms or 900 megahertz things kind of more like those cordless phones. So fewer people are actually using business band radios. And the places that are, like let's say Costco and some of the big box stores where you see people walking around with these kind of business radios on, well, they're usually running pretty low power and they're inside a big metal building, so you can probably operate around that area on the same frequencies that they are without interfering with one another. And that's why the FCC has provided something called itinerant frequencies. These are frequencies that can be shared and you just try to stay out of each other's way. And once you license a itinerant frequency, you actually no longer have to deal with the frequency coordinator and your cost is much lower. Now you're in the hundred to $500, depending again on what you're trying to do with radios and repeaters and people. So once you get that business band license, you need to set up a business and have a business, you have a couple of advantages. One is everybody that's attached to that business or that venture or that endeavor can use the radios without every single one of them going and taking their own test or getting their own license. But the other thing is that you can now use encryption and you can now use it for business purposes. And there's a bunch of business band radios that exist like this Hytera here that are capable of all kinds of cool business features. Like this radio, if it fell into the wrong hands, like a, a rival business, we could remotely lock and kill this radio. We can load this thing with a bunch of different encryption keys and we can get rid of those remotely using the uh, various Hytera features. But Motorola and a bunch of the other business radio companies have really similar features across some of their radios. Uh, Motorola's can be kind of expensive, Kenwood gets a little bit cheaper, and then the Hytera here, this is what we use at T-Rex with our business band license. It allows us to do a bunch of different stuff, and I highly recommend it for people that fall into this very specific UHF or VHF small area encryption sort of scenario. But for wider purposes over here, amateur radio is almost impossible to beat. Now, I mentioned that individual devices are supposed to only be used on individual bands, but that actually raises uh, a problem, some gray area. Now, there's no gray area when it comes to the spectrum. As you can see, there's all this VHF space that is split up into very specific things, and UHF space split up into very specific things. FRS and GMRS overlap, but nothing else does. The problem is that a lot of the radios themselves kind of do, because nowadays radios are digital, not so much analog. So a UHF VHF radio could very easily be programmed to be a MERS radio, a FRS radio, a GMRS radio, or operate on itinerant business frequencies. And so now it is an all band, all licensed radio, even though the FCC doesn't want that device to do all of those different things. And I mentioned before, there are some specific rules about FRS radios that do not have uh, removable antennas. That's a pretty obvious one. But the devices that are supposed to be certified to do different things in different bands gets a little bit problematic when a bunch of them come straight from China and they have the identical case, they have the identical brain, they have the identical antenna, sometimes Loctited in place, so it's not removable, sometimes not, and an FCC certification sticker for part 90 or part 95 or whatever different license that it's supposed to be operating on, and they're all the same radio inside. The question then becomes, are you actually complying with the specific licenses uh, if the manufacturers kind of aren't? And that is, uh, just kind of a, an issue that we're going to run into because the FCC regulations that we have now 
are a little bit behind. They weren't really written with some of uh, the realities of modern international trade uh, in mind or with digital wideband uh, software defined radios in mind either. So there are probably ways in which the FCC rules could be improved so that some of this gray area is cleared up. The good news is that that is kind of happening slowly, very, very slowly. Garmin was able to lobby for um, GMRS radios to carry little bits of data, something that was previously not allowed because after all this is the 21st century, and they managed to get the FCC to allow little bits of digital communication on the GMRS band. So that is pretty cool. And then just a few months ago, the FCC agreed that HF radio down here could actually transmit data as fast as you wanted, not with a specific baud rate that was from the 1980s, uh, the era of war games and acoustic couplers and modems. Now, if you come up with a cool way to transfer data at a higher bit rate, uh, on some of these lower frequencies, you can do it. There are no artificial speed limits there. So the FCC is slowly bringing its regulations up to, I would say, the later part of the 20th century, which is a step in the right direction. Now, speaking of the past, there is another radio license that doesn't get talked about very much on uh, survivalist forums, ham radio forums, or uh, the modern internet. And the reason is, it's just not very cool anymore. But citizens band radio still works. There's this very interesting kind of forgotten radio that lives down here in this space, kind of halfway in between the handheld HTs of UHF and VHF and the super long antennas of HF. There are 27 channels of CB radio right down here around 27 megahertz. And there are no license requirements whatsoever. I think there were in the past, but now anybody can get a CB radio, and as long as it doesn't break the rules, they can transmit on those 40 channels. Now, this is something that was more popular in the past. In the days before cell phones and in the days before other types of radios, CB radio was incredibly common, and it still is pretty widely used amongst truckers but it has sort of fallen out of favor as more people want to use the internet to communicate and cell phones to talk and so forth. CB has kind of changed. There aren't as many uh, Chinese companies making very cool radios with tons of extra features in that CB space. It is still Cobra and Uniden or Uniden or however you pronounce their name that make most of the CB radios in the States. And there are uh, CB radios from other countries, but technically they operate outside of what a American CB radio should do in America. So falls into some of that same gray area that some of these radios do. But CB does work. Depending on how you set up your antenna and which channels you use, you actually have an area in here that can skip and go long range the way that HF does most of the time. And you also have something that is relatively affordable and can be used for short range communication up here. There are limitations to it, obviously. Handheld CB radios are limited to four watts. Actually, I think they're all limited to four watts unless you're on single sideband when you can go to 12. Now, interestingly enough, uh, speaking of gray areas and people working sort of outside of the rules, it is not uncommon for truckers to be running CB radios at hundreds of watts, occasionally thousands of watts, which is part of the reason that CBs have kind of fallen out of favor. The FCC did not regulate the CB space quite as aggressively as they have some of the others, and so there's a lot of just insanely overpowered rigs out there that just drown out a lot of the other traffic. Have you paid your dues, Jack? Yes, sir, the check is in the mail. If you live really close to major highway overpasses or intersections, CB may be just too busy a band for you. It may not be worth it to even explore. But if you live in a more rural area, uh, it might make more sense. If you're doing a lot of overlanding, if you're doing a lot of off-roading, uh, there's a lot of CB use inside of these things. CB makes a lot of sense when you have a larger antenna and you have it mounted to an electrical vehicle and you're able to power that mobile radio with a constant power supply from that vehicle. I would, I would skip 
CB handheld radios at this point and go strictly with vehicles and large mounted antennas. And the other cool thing about CB is those 40 channels had specific expectations for all of them. They weren't exactly rules per se, except for channel nine. Channel nine was for emergencies and people were supposed to stay off unless they had very specific emergency requests or information about the road. And then the other channels also had some less strict but specific use cases. So for example, channel 10 was for truckers that were on regional roads. Uh, 17 was for truckers who were traveling north and south. 19 was for truckers who were traveling east and west. Uh, 16 and four were for off-roading. And so there was already this expectation that if you wanted to talk to certain people about specific topics, there were specific channels that you could go to. Uh, and that is essentially what a communications plan or band plan should be. And whether you are going with CB radios because you want to interact with truckers and find out more about road conditions, although let's face it, we all know that truckers were not put on this earth to get it. Uh, or you want to talk to people in your local area about very specific things, you do need a communications plan. So hopefully, as we've talked about some of the different frequencies uh, that you can play in, some of the different licenses that you might want to pursue, some of the different devices and bands and ways of communicating in here, you have something of an idea of what you might want to pursue. But those CB radio channels are kind of cool. That is the sort of coordination that makes radios considerably more useful than just having one in your closet, turning it on when there's an emergency, and then skipping through the channels hoping that you will hear something. Knowing something as simple as channel 9 is for emergencies or channel 10 is for people on regional highways and you're more likely to get one because we're in a rural area, that goes a long way. So even if you go with, say, GMRS radios, which in many ways give you the most bang for your buck, they give you the widest amount of people for your license, they give you repeaters, they give you high levels of uh, uh, mobile wattage, they give you a little bit of data, they give you a whole bunch of different things. Even something as simple as saying, this channel is the one that we check on the hour. This is the low power channel that we use for small unit stuff. This is the one that we use for emergencies and we check it at these specific times. That is the type of coordination that lets you get way more out of a radio than just, you know, having it. So as you consider your radio plan, your combo plan, your band plans and things like that, um, hopefully this is helpful and you do begin to do the kind of coordination that is necessary to make these not just fun gadgets to tinker with and chat with folks uh, on I-40, but you actually turn them into useful tools that let you accomplish more stuff. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you get big and complicated and cool HF rigs. Uh, I would show you mine, but I am actually loaning it to someone right now. The tech prepper is building it out for an experiment that you will see in uh, hopefully a few weeks, maybe a little bit longer. He's, he's, making, he's making good progress. As cool as that HF rig is, as far as it is going to let us talk, as much spectrum as it is going to allow us to see and to listen to and to gather information from, sometimes the smallest and the cheapest radios that actually have a plan behind them are going to be the most effective. So, Across all these different radios, think about what it is that you are trying to accomplish and uh, go out there and get started with any of the licenses or the license-free radios, um, whichever fits your communication plan and the things that you are trying to get done. And down here you have your shortwave radios, uh, which actually have some really interesting stuff on them sometimes. In fact, that is a piece of spectrum that would be very interesting to purchase for yourself. And remember, there are chunks of spectrum that are still available to buy. If you have enough money and you have access to the right lawyers, you can call up the FCC and you actually can buy uh, chunks of this radio spectrum for your own personal use. Um, and it would be really interesting to have a shortwave radio station that broadcasted stuff like, I don't know, that T-Rex podcast that I mentioned earlier, 24-7 around the world. Uh, so if you have the kind of money that uh, allows you to buy chunks of spectrum, um, uh, call me because I have some ideas. <laughs>